Good day, nerds, and welcome to episode 109 of the Nerd Cantina Show. And today we have a Cantina conversation with our book reviewer, Megan McCarthy Bianc, and the author, Katie Rose Poole. Uh, Katie Rose Poole is the author of the Age of Darkness trilogy, uh, which books one and two are out now. Uh, book two just recently came out, and she's in the process of finishing book three. And Megan and them discuss some of the characters, how she came about the story, how she came to becoming a writer. Uh, if you're a fan of Katie Rose Poole, welcome to the Nerd Cantina, and we hope you uh, you enjoy this in-depth discussion on some of the characters and the development of this, these stories. And if you're new to Katie Rose's work, this is a, a great interview. It seems like and uh, Megan and Katie had uh, a good time putting this together for the group. So hope you enjoy the listen. Okay, we are here with uh, Katie Ro- Rose Poole, author of the Age of Darkness series. Thank you once again, Katie, for joining us today. Um, I know it's, it's probably been a busy and unconventional, um, you know, press route, uh, you know, routine for you this time around. So appreciate you, uh, you know, coming on our show and then also, um, you know, just off, you know, helping us to offer our readers and listening listeners a little something, uh, you know, deeper into what you're offering in terms of the story and the world that you presented with us or for us. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So this book, uh, these first two books had, had some layers. <laughs> um, you know, I, it, you know, as a reader, I think it might've taken me a little while to kind of, um, catch on to some things because the your writing style with you, you didn't front load us with a bunch of background at the beginning, which I appreciated. You kind of just like eased it, eased us into it. And then eventually, you know, you hear the, you know, you present these like terms and, and these like, um, you know, patterns and kind of rules of this world, but you didn't really have any of the characters explicitly feed it to us, which I appreciated. Um, and then I eventually, I started to connect the dots and I started recognizing terms and names for things (laughs) and characters because there's a little bit, there's quite a bit to to, um, follow along with. But once, once the reader gets the hang of it, at least in my opinion, it's, it's pretty compelling. And um, I, I, it was just so well written. There's, you know, kind of, um, you know, like I was saying, there's just like a lot of layers, I feel like, and, you know, not just with the world, but how all these, um, pieces are, are playing a role and how the characters are playing a role in the bigger picture. And, um, you know, I was just, once I got into it, it was, I almost couldn't put the book down. So, um, I have a lot of, I have some questions on everything I just, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like said to you. So, um, what, so how about let's start with like the basics of like maybe go into your background and, um, you know, how you came up with like this story, your idea or the world that you, um, of these five characters and then, and you know, the whole, maybe not, you don't, maybe necessarily don't have to go into the prophecy, but I mean, obviously that's like a huge part of it. Sure. Um, so, yeah. So like, how did you come up with, um, with all this stuff? Yeah. So my background essentially in terms of writing, like I have been writing stories and specifically fantasy stories since I was very, very young. Um, And it kind of first started as like, almost like me wanting to reproduce my favorite fantasy stories, but make it my own. So like one of the first things that I ever wrote was like sort of like Sailor Moon yeah. <laughs> like Pearl gets magical powers, like all of that kind of stuff. And that just kind of persisted throughout my childhood. Um, and writing was always something that I did, um, you know, along with whatever, whatever other thing kids do, schoolwork, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I grew up, my, my dad is a screenwriter, so it was interesting to, to have that in my life, the knowledge that writing is a career Yeah, from a very young age, that was something that I was cognizant of um, and something that I, I knew that I wanted to do um, and specifically knew that I wanted to write books. Um, so that's kind of my, my background. And in terms of how I finally did write a book <laughs> and got it published, <laughs> um, the idea for the Age of Darkness series, I always kind of struggle to answer this question because I feel like it wasn't one 
idea that sparked the book. It was a lot of different little ideas that all slowly came together. Um, And so I really started that process with coming up with these characters. And there's the five POV characters um, that we meet in There Will Come a Darkness. And that those those characters were really my starting point for the whole story. And everything kind of came out of that. So like the prophecy and the magic system, everything sort of spawned out of these characters and then of course like once you start coming up with world building stuff like that starts to influence yeah characters and there's kind of like that feedback loop um so yeah really it did start there and then there was a lot of 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 my ideas for the book came from a lot of like strange things that i was studying in college i'm a history major so Mm. um (laughs) For instance, like the, I, I studied um, basically periods of time in which people thought that the apocalypse was going to happen. Right. Now I feel like we can really understand that. Yeah. <laughs> can relate um, a little bit more. But at the time I was studying it, uh, it, was, it, it was an interesting concept to me that there were these periods of time where people truly felt the world was ending. Now I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you're like, okay, I get it. Like. <laughs> um, so that and, and studying classics and ancient Greece. And um, I actually took a, took a class about science fiction and prophecy so it was like okay. kind of all of these weird, strange ideas that all went into the idea for the book. And then it was the characters that kind of all brought it together for me. Okay. So yeah, you kind of started with the characters and then like, um, you know, you know, kind of picked in or got inspiration from like little nuggets of your education and, um, <laughs> you know, just like things that you, that you kind of came across into other activities that you were doing or other you know, history or other lessons that you were becoming familiar with. Um, that's really cool. So kind of like going back. So like you you mentioned your father was a screenwriter. And so that's really, I, I love that that's, you had a positive of, of writing in terms of being able to make money. Cause I, you know, it could definitely struggle. And there are some authors who, you know, they, they work on something for years and years or, and then they get turned down and, um, you know, multiple times where they just keep going for it. And um, so was it, but you knew that you wanted to write books, like you wanted to write prose, not like screen writing, like your, like your dad. Right. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I think, I mean, I, I think there were certainly periods of time where I was like, Oh, writing for TV would be fun, but like, that's a completely different career path. Oh, yeah. And, and for me, I was always drawn to writing books because I think um, there's no other type of writing that I could do where you could really like delve as deeply into a character's psyche as you can in a book. You know, when you're watching something on a screen, that's very different from being able to actually write the character's thoughts and sort of reactions to things versus watching them. So I think that's why I always was drawn to to prose and to novel writing um, versus, you know, screenwriting like what my dad did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I imagine with screenwriting, it's kind of like the writer knows, you know, that that deeper backstory and that deeper, like, um, what's going on in the character's head. But, you know, writing that in screen, you know, for for screen, like, or short film or whatever, um, you know, what you see in the finished product isn't, like, you know, it doesn't even cover it's just kind of the tip of the iceberg literally where it just like it yeah. just covers a bit like kind of like the the surface and then you know with very little known unless you're like a super fan like doing all this research or going into um you know really diving deep into um the history and the background of these uh films and shows um it's really you know you don't always get all of that that you would get in in a novel so I I totally see where you're coming from with that and I I think the the other part of it too was uh my dad's experience as a screenwriter had taught me that in screenwriting it's such a collaborative process that the writer has very little control yes um and you know ultimately for movies at least like a lot of the control is up to like these executives these studios Mm -hmm. and as a book writer I don't have that problem like yes I have an editor yes I have a publisher but ultimately the words on the page are my own and I have complete control over them 
<laughs> and for someone like me, like I felt that was very important too. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Cause I think, yeah, like you said, um, with screenwriting or producing anything for the screen, uh, yeah, it's so collaborative and you get all this feedback immediately. And, um, you know, there are so many cooks in the kitchen yeah. And, um, whereas, yeah, like when you're writing a novel, it, it the collaboration is kind of like in phases where mm-hmm. you can, you know, do a draft and then submit it and then it either, you know, gets chopped up or maybe not so much. <laughs> like if it's, you know, if it's working really well, then maybe there's a uh, very little, uh, feedback in terms of like a need for improvement. But yeah, in general, it's, you know, if you're writing for screen, it, it, there's like so many other people involved and in, for the finished product. Whereas if you're, you're an author, I think, and you also like, you have more control over cause it's your baby, you know, and you have more yeah. control over what's <laughs> coming, you know, and like how you're presenting it to the world too. Um, and you know, so what was, um, so were there any like big things that maybe your publishers or editors kind of like, any obstacles or like um, anything that they wanted you to to switch up or, or, you know, maybe something they, they picked at or that they asked you to leave out or that maybe that you were really attached to, like, were there any like really big struggles with developing this story? Cause um, do you have number three written already or is it kind of still like, um, so I have, I do have a draft of that. I am actually revising it right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the third one is, is written to some extent, like okay. a draft. Um, Cause I know some, some authors just have them out and then they release them. Um, you know, they have it all written and then they release them, you know, they time it. So I just didn't right. know, you know, how, how that process is for you and any struggles you've had, like with getting these first two books out. Um, I mean, tr- the answer is truly no. Uh, <laughs> I feel ha- I've been very blessed in my sort of editorial relationship with both um, my agents and then now my editor um, at my publisher in that every sort of round of revision that we do, it's less of him, you know, telling me what to put in the book or what sh- I shouldn't be in the book and more him trying to see what my vision for the book is and okay. how we can better get the draft there. Cause my first drafts are not um, perfect. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think there's always that sense that at this point now I've written three books and he's worked with me on three books that there's that trust. And my trust in him is that he'll see what I'm trying to do and help me get there. Yeah. And so yeah. the collaborative process has been really, really rewarding because I never feel like I have to, you know, really dig in and like argue in, yeah. you know, a negative way. There's always discussion around things and like what's going to actually be best for the book, but there's that trust that we're both trying to get to the same vision. Um, yeah. So I feel really blessed that that has been my experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Cause I know, um, I don't, you know, cause I've interviewed a handful of authors, especially in 2020 in general, I think has just been so crazy. Um, <laughs> in terms of like, even within the publishing and, and, uh, editing and releasing industry, it's, it's a, a lot of people are forced to do, uh, things not as business as usual. And so, yeah. um, you know, that I, I always ask authors like how that process is and what kind of challenges and you face and, you know, how this experience, cause this, and especially for you as a debut author, like this is your, uh, sequel, but this is like your first published, uh, series. And so, um, you know, kind of going off of that, you know, releasing, going through that whole process the first time around, mm-hmm when there wasn't a pandemic going on, <laughs> when there wasn't like so many, like, the remember that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, whenever that happened, like, <laughs> Oh God. Um, uh, comparing that to this time around with the second book, um, how, you know, what, what were like maybe the biggest lessons learned challenges face, like what, you know, how are you coming out of it? Um, I mean, I think it's hard to say right now, like I don't have the distance from, from this second release that I have from, that debut experience. Um, I mean, and there's always going to be a difference between releasing a sequel and releasing the beginning of a series Yep. in that a sequel, you're trying to sort of build off an existing readership who's picked up the first book and you're trying to also entice people to 
now go back and pick up yes. that first book. And yeah. that was really, I felt my role as the author was to write the very best sequel I possibly could because I wanted readers to people who had already read the first book to read the second book and be like, Oh wow. Like this series gets even better. Like you should get on the train now. Yeah. No, it did. 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 (laughs) That was sort of always, always my, my perspective and what I wanted to accomplish with book two was, uh, was to be able to bring those existing readers in and have them really get on board um, in a way that would hopefully bring more readers to the series as well. And then in terms of releasing a book during a pandemic, (laughs) there's really, I feel like there's a lot to be said about, you know, everything that's going on and and how it's affecting people in creative professions. But I will say, I think, you know, book writing is one of those things that it's definitely impacted by what's happening. And in fact, the publishing industry itself is quite impacted and there have been like printer shortages and Mm -hmm. I'm sure everyone has read or seen this at least in the news. But in terms of my role as an author, basically the biggest difference is I can't do in-person events in bookstores, which is an extremely delightful part of the job. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really stop people from picking up a book and reading it. It's not like going to the movies. It's not like, you know, going to a play. It's people can read books no matter what's happening in the world. Yeah, exactly. So in that sense, I've felt like a, you know, as much as it really is sad to not be able to, to have those gatherings and to celebrate the book sort of in this external way, I don't necessarily feel like it it means that you know people aren't going to read the book like and they would have otherwise or that it's impacted in such such a larger way um which is good and I also hope like my hope is that people who are picking up the book and reading it like it's bringing them some amount of of solace or joy during this time and like it is a book that on the cover it says let the end of the world begin (laughs) (laughs) so the escapism factor yeah right I'll say despite that to me it's a very fun book um and it's sort of a book that I think hopefully people can read and and feel like you know even if the world is ending (laughs) Like there, it, there are these moments of joy to be found. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I, and I talk about this a lot because it, you know, every as corny as it sounds, like we all are in this together. But it's like, you know, it's okay to talk about how how hard of a time that you're having, wherever you are, you know, or whatever stage of either coping or what whatever you use to cope or or take care of yourself, um, your health you know, physically, mentally, all that good stuff, because like, you know, reading, as you said, it could like, people can do it anywhere, anytime. Um, you know, you can get digital books. If you really want a hard copy, it might just take a little longer to get to you, you yeah. know, but it's like, yeah, it's, you know, you could read in a safe way too. Digital copies are very safe. It's like, you <laughs> use your reader and you could stay hold up. And it's, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge bookworm. And so, reading um, and having a fabulous to read list to occupy my time and, and having the opportunities to like speak with uh, the authors like you and just to like kind of dig in. It just, it really, it is a way to cope and it's a way to like kind of escape and unwind. And, and, you know, even, even if it's a little too uh, timely <laughs> in terms of what's going on, it's still kind of like, well, you know, I can relate to this person or I can relate to this situation or I, I kind of identify with this character a little bit because, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, like, and, and that's what I really enjoyed about uh, this book too, is cause like it, it kind of makes sense that you kind of started with the characters first and then you kind of built this story and this plot and all these um, little interesting pieces and how they fit together around these people. Because I, you know, I'm a sucker for character driven and and character development. And um, that's what I loved about the second book um, is because as the shadow rises, because, you know, whereas the first book, you kind of, you're introduced to these uh, 
individuals and you get a feel kind of, you know, there's little foreshadowing in there of like what they went through. Um, for some of them, at least some of them, it's kind of like you learn really quickly. <laughs> and then with others, it's like, Oh, like, wait, wait, are we going to learn more about him or her? And, um, you know, but that's great storytelling. And then the second book, you know, you really see like, my heart hurt for some of these people. It was like with Jude, it's like, dude, it's okay. Like, Oh my God. <laughs> like I felt so bad for him. Like he's just, you know, he's, he's just so torn in between like his obligation, what he's like grown up, you know, believing and, and, and he's grown up. There's like this, like expecting his life to be a certain way and, and learning like, no, this is my place. I'm the only person like, you know, there's, there's nobody else who can take on this responsibility um, and then he's just like struggling with such a, a, like an innate, like human desire, like, you know, and it's just so struggling with it. And it just like broke my heart. And then with like, um, you know, and, and just with like, um, the sisters, uh, Afira and Baru with Afira, it's kind of like, I don't want to say she's backpedaling. She's definitely growing as a character, but it's almost like, she's kind of like going spiraling down for breaking bad a little yeah <laughs> she just was not little... that great to begin with no exactly exactly <laughs> like there was still something where she was just very like you know it's t- to the point and and she was just kind of like well, well tough shit this is life <laughs> and um but the second book she's kind of like you know it's 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 dialed up to a hundred she you know she it's she only has one goal in mind, no matter what. And it's, and it's so like heartbreaking that, you know, she's just at the end of the day, she's just like, is looking out for her sister. And then her sister has to like live with that burden, knowing that everything Afira does is for her. And then it's like, you know, and then there's like the reader, like we're kind of all learning all of these implications of like how they fit into the big picture. Mm -hmm. But then, um, it's almost there was at, at times where the reader kind of knows more than the characters themselves, or it's kind of like I, I don't know. There were there were times where I was like screaming in my head, <laughs> like "Oh, come on!" <laughs> That's kind of the fun of writing with multiple perspectives too, is being able to feed information to the reader that the character does not themselves have, yeah. and to have those moments of tension where where the reader knows something that is going to impact a character and you just are waiting for that to happen for them to find out. Right. Right. And then, yeah. And then it's so like going off of that. So like, which ones, which, which, which characters were, were more difficult to develop or maybe, you know, like you had more of a challenge, uh, uh, fleshing them out and then which ones were easier, or maybe more fun. I'm, I'm assuming all of them were fun to flesh out, but you know, maybe which ones were like the most difficult and, and which ones were a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, well, I think it really shifted from book to book. So with the first book, um, I really enjoyed writing Jude's character um, quite a bit because kind of all of the stuff that you mentioned about, um, him sort of really trying hard to fit into this role that he believes he's destined for, but at the same time wanting things that don't really fit into yeah. that destiny. Um, and writing that struggle, there was just something about that and the, and the way that he thinks about his duty and his feelings that is always really interesting for me to dig into. Um, and that was true for book two as well. Um, Anton, I think was a little bit more of a challenge in book one. Um, I absolutely loved writing his whole arc in the first book because I'm trying to do this without spoiling. Yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah. Any spoilers. Yeah. Um, appreciate it. <laughs> because there, there's sort of this sense that he's really haunted by his past. Yeah. By this abuse essentially that he's undergone from his brother but there's also a sense that the reader has that Anton doesn't quite understand everything that has happened to him and he is sort of running from this thing that he doesn't fully comprehend yeah um and so writing the balance of that of what you know being able to hint to the reader that there was this sort of larger story to Anton's past without 
Anton really knowing that, that was really challenging, yeah, um, but really, really rewarding to write once I felt like I, I found the balance of that. And then, of course, once once you get to the moment in the book where all of that kind of comes together and he's able to really reckon with his past, um, was super fun to write. I should, it's fun, I should say it was cathartic to write, I sure. guess. <laughs> um, and um, I think Ephira consistently is a difficult character to write in, in particularly in the second book, as we have sort of already mentioned, she has sort of this uh, downward spiral that happens. Um, and that felt really important for me to show because it was, she really, her whole life has been built for taking care of her sister and protecting her sister. And so it was, I think, really interesting for me to dig into what happens when she doesn't have that anymore and Mm -hmm. what happens to her and what choices does she make? And it turns out the choices that she makes are just the worst (laughs) choices possible. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Which was actually really fun. It was challenging, but it was fun to write a character who is truly, I think truly like self-destructing in certain ways. Um, yeah. And seeing, you know, is she going to be able to pull back from this? Like, is she going to be able to figure out a way forward? Because I think that's something that, you know, it's, it's relatable in some sense <laughs> to, right. to anyone who has sort of had those tendencies or who has undergone like a really intense grief and had to work through it somehow. Um, so that was, again, one of those things that was challenging, but also... <laughs> <laughs> fun for me to write. And I think that kind of speaks to who I am as a writer, which is I'm always trying to tackle these storylines that are really, really challenging. Um, but that ends up being what I enjoy writing the most because once I do feel like I I get it right or I at least get it close to right, that's like the most rewarding thing for me. There's a storyline in the third book that I will not talk about, but it has to do with something that happens at the end of book two. Mm. (laughs) Um, And it is one of the most challenging things I have ever written. And so right now I'm in the stage of like, why did I do this? Why did I go here? (laughs) So we'll see what happens, but I'm hoping at some point I will, it'll click. I'll have that, that moment where it clicks and I'm, I have the really rewarding feeling of, of, getting it right (laughs) I mean you've been doing it I would say you know just drum up that confidence because if you're having if you have if you go through that stage every time and you come out of it like you know bigger and better and and relieved and accomplished then just trust yourself that it'll happen again (laughs) as much of a struggle as that is just be like no it's okay I've done this before I got this like yeah it might (laughs) suck in the process but the end result, um, you know, I, I would say you're, if it's kind of a ritual for you, <laughs> like it is, it very yeah. much is. It's like a very self flagellating <laughs> like masochistic ritual. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And then, you know, <laughs> it just reminds me like some authors will just like punish, punish their, uh, characters and their readers in the process. It's like, no, this is going to happen. Like, <laughs> like I'm doing this and no matter what, like, no, that's, that's really cool. Cause like, um, you know, cause like with, with Anton, I think, you know, I could see myself like having a drink or two with him. He was pretty fun. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I fear I was just like, you know, it's kind of like where you saying earlier, it's like, Oh man, like, I don't know. I'm still kind of rooting for her, even though like I haven't given up on her, even though she's kind of just the, without Baru, she, like she just still doesn't know what to do with herself. And yeah. that's what Baru wanted. Baru wanted her to like, um, she, she didn't want her to be, become worse than what she might have already, already become. And it, it kind of backfired, unfortunately, or it seems like it's, it's, you know, it, from all, for, I guess from both of their points of view, from Afira's point of view, it doesn't seem like she's just, she's just going, she's kind of like, She's not looking in the rear view mirror. She, she's, she's just plowing forward. And yeah. like, if she's in a car, she's plowing forward no matter what or who she runs over. And it's, it's almost heartbreaking, but yeah, at the same time, I'm still like, I haven't given up on her. I'm like, <laughs> mine, girl, like, you're just like kind of hoping that, um, 
she can find like some sort of peace and, you know, like that she doesn't have to feel like she's, she's consistently chasing a solution. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's like, it kind of makes you think like what, you know, how far would I go for a sibling or, you know, for like how, how far would I go for anybody that, that meant that much to me? And it's, yeah, it's kind of, I was like, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, man. But, uh, you know, if you're, she's just like going for it. She does not, she doesn't have any F's to give at this point. (laughs) Um, so, <clears throat> oh, kind of, um, so you pull off distinguishing between the different points of view pretty well. Cause like sometimes it's really difficult to do that. And you kind of touched on this before where, you know, that's kind of like how you, you kind of articulated, uh, one of my earlier, uh, compliments where, you know, you, there are so many layers and stuff, but you didn't kind of like front load it. You didn't give us, feed us the background, like you didn't spoon feed us the background and and the details of the world. You kind of like how you said, you, you know, you revealed it to the reader through various points of views and, you know, and in certain phases, um, you know, based on like the, the releasing of the information that you shared with us. And so how, um, you know, how challenging was it to like give everybody kind of like distinct, um, I guess it could, because you're writing it in third person, maybe it's a little bit easier versus if you're writing in first person, trying to distinguish between voices. But like, was there any like big struggle with that, with having to um, bounce back and forth between these points of views? Um, I think the, the sort of um, differentiation between each of the characters' voices came very organically for me. It wasn't something that I sat down and like mapped out in any sort of scientific way. Sure. It, was, it more just came from, you know, what what are the internal struggles that each of these characters are dealing with and the way that the way that they deal with those things and the way that they think about those things was just naturally very different from one another. So as you mentioned, you have a Fira who is very just ruthlessly eyes on the prize, mm-hmm. you know, blinders on versus you know someone like Jude who is very much uh you know ruminates a lot on his feelings and and his future and his destiny and like those are two just very distinct voices naturally yeah. Yeah. um for me um and then in terms of sort of switching back and forth between them that was a challenge in that sort of I would <laughs> I would like forget where emotionally a character was. Oh. I came back to one of their chapters where I'm like, wait, <laughs> like I would literally have to go back and be like, yeah. what happened to you? Like, where are you at with your feelings? Like yeah. what's going on with you <laughs> in order to be able to write that next chapter. And with the second book, I actually was able to sort of write most of the POVs like beginning to end together so that I didn't have that problem okay it would be like here's Beru's like chat like for part one here's all of her chapters and like here's part two so I would like go back and not have to switch every other chapter right (laughs) to be a little I'm like trying to keep in my in my head what what everyone's dealing with what their emotions are what their priorities are um and that gets very complicated So, yeah, I think my approach to to writing these different POVs was just sort of really trying to root it in those emotions and in, you know, whatever their goals were and whatever their sort of arc ended up being. Yeah, no, I think that's a good route. It worked. Um, You know, because like I said, it wouldn't, you know, some some books are told they bounce back and forth between uh, characters. And, um, you know, it's like if it's a good way to... it's it's a good way to to tell a story in terms of like building suspense, but you gotta like be consistent. You gotta be careful. You have to, um, like you said, you you know you have to make sure that you're you remember the headspace that um, all these characters are in, and, and because you have them just traveling around too and going on these like little different journeys within this um, you know big picture. And so I just you know I as a reader I loved 
I, you know, I, it kept me entertained. It was very entertaining. It was a good way to like keep the story going, even because book one is kind of like um, not as action packed, I guess, because you're kind of you know there's a lot to dive into as far as getting to know the world and and peeling back the layers. Um, and then with with book two, it just kind of you kind of like pick up right where you left off, and you're like, all right like it's go time and like <laughs> it's, you know, this is what we're doing and um, you know, strap yourself in kind of thing. So like one of the things I noticed um, you have like, you know, sibling relationships and you depict them to them, like between the sisters and then between the brothers, like the almost opposite where, you know, uh, if you're in Peru where they were, um, they're like best friends, they're, you know, not necessarily joined at the hip, but they're in it together and they support each other. And, um, the fear is very protective and, and she cares for her. Whereas, uh, Anton and Ilya are, um, maybe it's a minor spoiler. I don't know. The book's out like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, if, uh, Ilya and, and Anton are just like, it's like the exact opposite with them. It was like, you know, right. Yeah. It's just so much fear. And, um, you know, he, Anton left because of that, uh, lack of relationship or that abusive relationship. Um, and so kind of like, you know, was that, I guess what I'm getting to, like, so I, I just thought it was like really fascinating. And was there anything like, how, how, why did you decide to like uh, kind of go that route or maybe depict like the opposite ways of sibling relationships or even maybe any time of any type of familial relationship could go? Yeah. I mean, I think it wasn't necessarily a super conscious decision at the outset. Um, I just naturally like to include sibling relationships in my work because I have siblings and those relationships are important to me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I find that sort of relationship to be really interesting um, because, you know, siblings are potentially like the most formative people in your life from a very early age Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, other than your parents. And it it is a very different sort of relationship because your siblings are your peers in some senses. And so with Afira and Beru, my sort of goal at the outset with them was I wanted to depict these sisters who sort of care about each other so intensely that, Obviously, Afira is, like, driven to kind of, you know, these morally dubious ends to protect her. Um, I wanted to take that sort of, I think, very familiar familiar (laughs) sister relationship that I think we see in a lot of media where, you know, you have the older sister who is there to protect her younger sister. But I wanted to really complicate that and kind of see how that could go wrong, even though these two people do love each other a lot and they mean a lot to one another. Um, I just wanted to show the various nuances of how that sort of, you know, one sister has put herself in the role of protector, how that can really create these, these issues um, and create actually distance between them in certain ways. And then with Anton and Ilya, um, I, I, I was sort of inspired by this idea of of so- someone who is again I think this is a familiar trope sort of a child who is seen by their family as some sort of like savior or chosen one yeah. um, in in Anton's family like he uh his he has grace and Ilya does not and I wanted to have it be that Anton is the younger brother, but he's sort of the favored son and show the dynamics of how, you know, in these really unhealthy family relationships where one child is favored for, for one reason or another, um, how that really messes up both kids. Yeah. Um, And this (laughs) is not to, you know, excuse Ilya's behavior or say that it's not his fault that he's so abusive to Anton but, you know, they were raised in this situation and it results in this really fractured relationship between them. Yeah. And that relationship was really interesting to me. And 
plays out in a certain way in the first book, but you'll kind of see throughout the series how each of them have to come to terms with, with their past and with their relationship and what they've each done. Um, so in terms of sort of contrasting the two relationships, I, that was something that I sort of realized much later I had done where I was like, oh, I have these specific relationships and they're super different. Um, and I think it was just me being interested in sibling relationships in general and being interested in showing all of the facets and nuances. Yeah. Of that. Yeah. No, cause that's, that's a good point. Cause it's like, you know, I'm sure that happens in a lot of families where, um, you know, and nobody likes to say who the favorite is, but I think there almost always is, or, you know, for whatever reasons, or you, maybe you favor, like, say I have a three-year-old and I have one on the way and I'm like really hoping I don't fall, fall in, you know, give my dig myself a hole or fall into that trap of favoring one over the other. Um, but I think it's just, you know, it, it happens where, um, you know, for what one reason or another, maybe you just, parents might be a little more proud or brag about one of their kids a little bit more. And that's like what Anton's grandmother was doing it. But, and then it kind of ties back to like um, this uh, where the region where they're from and the history of um, the graced and, you know, like, like, Oh no, like you were chosen. It's, It's like this, you know, holy thing. And which is complete opposite of like this, this, uh, you know, seemingly cult like movement going on. Um, it's putting the grace in danger with like, Mm -hmm. um, the hero fan and his witnesses and the reckoning, um, where the great, you know, those who are graced are like hunted down and, and persecuted. And, and, you know, it's, it's, those are the two like contrasting views, but it's, you know, it's, you can kind of see it happening. Like, uh, of course it would happen. Like if some people, you know, y- and you see it happening in other plots too, like in other storylines for, um, you know, for instance, like with the whole uh, X-Men or like Marvel, like, you know, you see them the deeper level where it's the public perception. And unfortunately it takes like, you know, just a, f- a few people who are louder or the loudest um, to speak up and, and, you know, people to agree with them and, and you get this mob mentality where, you know, all these people are dangerous or they're not, they're abomination. They're not supposed to exist. And, um, you know, it's, that also ties into the bigger picture too, and how, you know, everything is unfolding. And then towards the end of the book too, like you see why almost you're like, wait a second, like what's, you know, the whole, all these answers get flipped on its head and it's like, you know, I, there were a couple of things where like a couple of reveals that I didn't see coming. And then it was like, and then, you know, once I, I realized that, then it's like, you kind of have to go back and like, like, wait a second, like, wait a second. Okay. So <laughs> like, cause there's a lot of history with this story. And then once, you know, you realize okay, this is a familiar name or where have I heard this before? It's so wait, like, and then you kind of join in the world where everything that you learn uh, is kind of is challenged and you almost don't want to believe it. But then it's like, okay, I think like (laughs) I, you know, because I'm such a bookworm, I kind of get used to like that happening um, Mm -hmm. in storylines. And so it was like, but it was, you know, I, it was, you know, it was very well done and it, it kind of just, it, it, it almost kind of reflected, um, you know, some real life events or some like common themes in literature in general, I think where, um, you know, we, you see a group of people who are different and then, you know, maybe they're seemingly harmful or there's a handful of people who are, are making decisions and who are looked to for guidance, but then in reality, it's something completely different and, and, you know, it's, you have to like undo all these years of, of history and, and, and getting the truth out there, um, which is like a whole nother battle in itself. And so that was, that's why I'm like, one of the things I'm just like really excited for book three to see like how the aftermath of all that, that went down at the end of the second book. It's just like how it's going. So I remember I, you know, cause I have a tendency to like read books or start a series without realizing they're a series. And then I'm like, Oh my God, the third one or the whatever doesn't come out for a while. And so I'm, 
you know, when I was done with the first book, I was like, okay, at least I have the second book already. Like, I'm not, <laughs> you know, because I'm, I'm not going through so much, like, uh, you know, torture here. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And, um, no, I, I, you know, I, I'll ramble on all day if, if I get to it. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, no, I appreciated that. And I thought that was really interesting how you kind of tied in how, how some of those events unfolded and it kind of, you know, it, it kind of reflects what I think what we see a lot, not only in literature, but like in real life too. Um, and then, you know, you're, 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 you're putting the people maybe in real life situations, but like um, with extraordinary circumstances and um, you kind of, when you kind of just go from there, it's like, I don't, you know, it could be mind boggling but at the same time, then you still find a way to relate to these individuals and this, the pain and the anger and the grief and the struggles that they're going through, like not with other people, but with themselves too. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, I, so um, what were, what were the most difficult scenes for you to write? Um, any, <laughs> I, ju- I actually just wrote a scene like this in book three. So this is like top of my head answer. Uh, any scene where there is a lot of characters and a lot of POV characters in particular. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they're all trying to do different things. <laughs> so there's definitely a scene like that in the climax of As the Shadow Rises, which without giving it away, like there's just a lot of different goals and everyone is sort of trying to do different things all at the same time right that's always really challenging because it's such a balance between like what is like if I'm in you know Anton's point of view like what is he focused on yeah but like you know maybe Jude's <laughs> over here doing something completely different that he's like <laughs> over and like it, it's one of those things where I do think about the difference between book writing and and movie writing because like in movie writing like if you watch like you know Avengers Infinity War, whatever, you can have like 12 characters and they're all fighting and the camera just pans. Never. <laughs> everything. Like sometimes when I'm writing those scenes, I'm like, I really wish I could just pan the camera. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> um, but instead, we're like in this one character's perspective and they, you know, they're focused on what they're focused on. So that's what I need to show the reader and find ways of of building in the other layers of action that are yeah. happening. Um, those are always super, super challenging. <laughs> um, and then I always really struggle with like the opening chapters of any book. Um, for some reason, I'm a rare writer, I think, who really enjoys writing the middle part of a book, <laughs> which I think spills <laughs> over into my series structure too, because I really enjoyed writing the middle book itself. Um, <laughs> where I just, I just like middles because they're so like messy like everyone's, you know, problems are going awry and like, I don't have to resolve them yet, (laughs) but like everything's just a mess. And the reader hopefully is like, you know, what is going to happen? Like, how are we going to get through this? That's fun for me to write beginning hard because it's sort of laying all of that groundwork and making sure that, you know, I am setting up things properly such that there's that pay off by the end of the book yeah yeah no that's one thing I liked about um at the end of book two is <laughs> there's a lot going on and it's like before you know we're switching viewpoints and then we're like oh wait okay <laughs> and then you I think I caught some of that too where like you wish you you had a camera to, to just like write it for you almost to, like for the show like, well, here's yeah. where everyone is like just let's just- yeah <laughs> see what they're all doing in like a 30 second pan <laughs> exactly exactly no and it, it, it I know I couldn't see how how that was a challenge too but it's almost like you know, it's almost it could be a little fun like kind of maybe once you get going but it, getting it on paper and making it make sense too um because it obviously makes sense in your head and so yeah it, it sometimes requires a lot of like diagrams <laughs> yeah <laughs> like me I have this whole sequence in the third book that I have, like, if there's a map, I had, like, different stickers for each character that I could move around. Like, it oh. was so complex. <laughs> I was like, I hope this makes sense by the end. Oh, <laughs> like, you know, I do, do, do what you gotta do, you know? Like, <sighs> whatever you gotta do to tell your story. Um, so I know we're wrapping up here. I'll just answer a couple more questions. Um, so 
Which character do you feel like you relate to the most? Um, my answer would be none of the uh, POV characters. Okay. <laughs> it, it is actually uh, the nameless woman who is a more mm. minor character. We meet her in book one. She kind of shows up again at the end of the first yeah. book. And then she has a, a, a larger role in book two. Okay, good. Um, I really enjoy writing her because she's constantly just like giving vague sort of directions yeah. <laughs> and drinking wine. And that's right. really the key for me is like her life is just, she just kind of goes around, like just travels the world, drinks wine and gives these like very vague sort of mysterious answers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to questions. So she's like sort of my self-insert character in that I'm the author. So I'm sort of, you know, <sighs> helping the characters along in that way. But she does actually, her character, um, there, there's like a much deeper level that even in book two, we have not learned yet. Right. Um, so that's also really fun for me to write that really kind of mysterious, like what's actually going that's on with so her. so funny. No, I know. It's like she, I liked her too, but she was very frustrating because it was <laughs> like, she know, obviously she knows everything that's going on and you know, like what's going on in her brain is she's just like wanting to slap Anton across the head and be like, dude, like what? Get it like, together. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, yeah. And she just shows up in the nick of, you know, it's seemingly, seemingly perfect times. And then, you know, answers that are just kind of like, but she has kind of has an attitude. It's like, what? This isn't it obvious. Like what? <laughs> and it's, it's no, I, 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 uh, I appreciated her, but I'm, I'm glad that we're going to get a little bit more of her um, in book three um, because she, you know, whenever she showed up, I was kind of like, okay, what, what now? Like, are we going to learn more or are we just going to get frustrated? Cause <laughs> it's like, is this either one or the other or both with this woman? So uh, <laughs> no, I, I liked her a lot. Um, so uh, what I, you know, obviously trying to be maybe a little bit spoiler free, um, you know, what, what can we look forward to in uh, the final installment of the trilogy? Um, this is, I think, the first time I've had to answer <laughs> this question, okay. which is kind of exciting because usually I'm having these conversations with the assumption that no one has read book two, but now it's okay. been out for a couple weeks, so yeah. <laughs> get on it. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so the third book, um, I think you can expect... Uh, the stakes to get even larger than they did in book two. Um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say things get pretty apocalyptic <laughs> um, in the world. I think um, without being too spoilery, I think book three was really, really fun for me to write um, because I kind of finally got to write all of the characters together, um, you know, working toward a common goal, which throughout the rest of the series, that does not happen. Mm -hmm. Um, they're all kind of on their own journeys and have their own quests, but in book three, because of what is happening with the world, like their stories really do converge and they really do have to figure out, you know, how to work together. And they, they still do each have their own agendas because of course, (laughs) Yeah, right. <laughs> so writing that balance of them working together, but maybe having some very different ideas about what and how to achieve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's always really fun to write. And so getting to write all of those dynamics where you're like, you know, you don't really get to see like Hassan and Afira interact a lot. Um, right, right, right. Books, but finally in book three, I get to explore all of those dynamics between all of these POV characters who you know, we've come to know so well throughout the first two books. And that was super, super fun for me to write. Yeah, because in books one and two, you kind of, uh, some of them meet, you know, uh, and interact, which was really fun. But um, I know I love it when readers are, patient readers are rewarded. And when there's like all these different lives that maybe they don't seem to be connected at first, but they're like totally connected. And then we get to see how, you know, different characters interact with one another. And especially when it comes to, um, you know, 
saving the world, essentially, <laughs> uh, you know, to put it, you know, for a lack of better words, but like it is what it is. And so this, no, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And um, I, you know, I, this is probably one of the better, uh, you know, series first two install two out of three installments I've read in, um, in a while, just because, uh, you know, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll give you all the kudos for um, having so many layers going on and revealing them appropriately and, <laughs> and, and pacing the books well enough to where even if there wasn't a lot of action, the reader's still learning and um, everything, all the details are, are pretty important, you know, later. Um, mm. So no, I, I, I loved it. I can't wait for the third book. I'm impatient already. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, thank you so much. So the book's out right now. Um, you know, by the time this interview comes out, hopefully we'll, you know, we'll have a lot of, you'll have more like, a, you know, readership where I don't have to feel like, you know, we're, um, we're giving away too much, but I think, <laughs> I think, I think we're safe. So, <laughs> um, but no, thank you once again, Katie, um, for meeting with us and, and seriously awesome awesome job on the book. And I don't know if you have any other projects or ideas that you're working on, but you know, we'll, I'll, I'm going to keep an eye and an ear out for anything you have going on in the future. Thanks so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you again for listening to episode 109 uh, and this Cantina conversation. We hope that you'll take a moment to support the podcast by just giving us a like and a share uh, and specifically a rating and review uh, as that'll that'll help us grow that'll help us to find some new audience and uh, get these author stories out there so please take a moment to do so and then join us again for episode 110 coming out next week as we'll recap the weekly news as we do every Wednesday all right well thank you very much and have a good one nerds